We've been given a list of things to correct, and in the process of doing that, we found a few other things. You gotta fix that ceiling. Ten days of grueling, painstaking inspections, known as Hell Week. November 2002. Work begins on the final three wings of the research station, raising the steel framework. It's the first stage of a building project that will last three years. 75 builders are working shifts to make the most of the Antarctic summer's 24 hours of daylight. You don't want me welding over yonder? Yeah, after you get the scaffold set up and get all the bolts and all the tools up. 340 tons of steel must go up over the next two summers. Let's get fired up, boys! <laughs> Woo! Come on! The steel workers have the hardest job on the project, working with icy metal and exposed to freezing winds. It's like no one else on the planet because the temperature gets to you. Even the metal is affected by the cold. It shrinks unevenly in the sub-zero temperatures. Engineering finesse must be replaced with something a little more basic. Banging on things with sledgehammers to make them fit, and uh, it's kind of rough, and it's not fine finish work, I can tell you that. <laughs> and when a part doesn't fit or gets damaged, the nearest spare is literally on the other side of the world. Improvisation is key. There's always a lot of plan B going on. A lot of cutting and welding, and we'll get a design from the engineers, and we'll just have to fabricate it here on site. Whatever it takes to get it all done. We're not going to miss that schedule, is what we've been told, so... The men in charge of the schedule are construction managers Carlton Walker and Jerry Marty. For them, starting work on the final stage of the project is a moment to savor. We first started talking about this thing in 94, 95. We were drawing it on the back of napkins. Out here, it's a full-time job. We work together off-season, on-season, putting together the planning to make sure that all this steel and all these, these panels are here on time. Meticulous organization is essential. The whole project requires 40,000 tons of construction materials and building equipment. All needs to be transported a distance of nearly 12,000 miles. And Jerry and Carlton get just one shipment a year. This far from civilization, any wrong or misordered part could cause delays running into millions of pounds. November 2004. The first flight of the season is about to land at the South Pole Station airfield. Each September, a freighter leaves Port Wainini, California, and heads for Littleton, New Zealand. Once there, an icebreaker clears a channel for the ship to steam onto the largest port in the Antarctic, McMurdo. The unloaded freight is then transferred onto round-the-clock flights to complete the final 900-mile leg of the journey. Waiting for the flight are a team of cargo handlers. They need to be on the strip well in advance, prepared to unload the plane as soon as it lands. Operations manager, Liesl Schirmtanner, has already been waiting 15 minutes. When the planes come right after one another, you might be out here for five hours straight, right? You're working hard, but you're not doing a lot of moving around. Fortunately, when it gets busy, cargo handlers have one of the most physical jobs at the pole. When the planes get here, it's time to rock and roll, and that's what we do, we rock and roll. We have a lot of planes coming in today. They'll be coming in about 45 minutes apart with a lot of big, heavy, dumb stuff. You gotta really hustle to get that going. There's a lot to do. Even though these Hercules LC-130s can carry a payload of 12 tons, the ground crew will still have to shift nearly a thousand flight loads to keep the project on target and the builders equipped with the supplies they desperately need. And in the summer months, flights land 24 hours a day. It's just totally cool to hop in a big rig like this and to move around stuff that, you know, a hundred people can move by hand. It's awesome. I love it. The builders have completed the steel framework of the polar station's final three wings. Now the team are starting to work on the next stage, attaching the insulated paneling. 
But there's a problem. A bulldozer and crane are not working. They're not broken. They're frozen. Without a crane, construction can't continue. Yep. Right, right. The nearest garage is 900 miles away, so every mechanical problem needs to be fixed on site. Mechanics have developed a specially designed gas heater to warm up frozen engines. Although it churns out enough heat to warm five houses, in this extreme cold, it's barely big enough to heat the engine above freezing. After several hours, the driver attempts to start the engine. In the intense cold, even the simplest task is far from easy. But if it's so difficult, why build here at all? For the American National Science Foundation, who are funding this project, the answer is simple. They're convinced Antarctica holds the key to answering many of the big scientific questions affecting our planet. For astronomers, the pristine atmosphere and location at the Earth's axis gives them a perfect place to look for new stars. Physicists are hoping to find subatomic particles trapped in the permanent ice sheet. And the cold and remoteness is perfect for climatologists investigating our impact on the planet. Because of its ideal location, scientists have wanted to establish a permanent base here for over 50 years. The first expedition to reach the South Pole was led by Norwegian Raoul Amundsen in 1911, followed a few months later by the ill-fated British explorer, Captain Robert Scott. But the first attempt to build a station was until October the 31st, 1956, when a US airplane landed at the Pole for the first time. Within days, 24 Navy servicemen had constructed prefabricated huts out of canvas and wood. But snow quickly took its toll. After just 10 years, the station was engulfed by 10-meter drifts, forcing the Navy to brace their huts with extra supports. In 1970, construction began on a new center, an aluminum dome designed to withstand 200 miles per hour winds. The idea was that the snow would flow over the structure without settling. Named in honor of the first explorers 65 years earlier, the Amundsen Scott Station transformed the South Pole into a scientific hotspot. Filled to capacity almost from the day it opened, the research carried out has affected us all. It was here in 1986 that scientists first established the link between the hole in the ozone layer and man-made pollution. With a diameter of 50 meters and a height of 16 meters, the dome could provide 23 people with living quarters, laboratories, library, communication center, medical center, post office, and a general store. It even had its own pub. Our only little bar at 90 South. It's got a little bit of character. <laughs> But although it looked high-tech, the dome was little more than a glorified tent sheltering prefabricated huts. Even a trip to the bathroom could mean walking through temperatures of minus 45 degrees. Built with 1970s technology and building codes, it's now hopelessly obsolete. And the dome had one even bigger flaw. Its smooth shape did not deflect snowdrifts. The only protruding object in a vast flat landscape, it acted as a windbreak, building up massive drifts that constantly threatened to crush it. Clearing snow became a never-ending and energy-intensive job, using 60,000 litres of fuel at a cost of 17,000 pounds a year. With its replacement now half-built, 
the dome's interiors are finally being dismantled. 15-year veteran of the pole station, B.K. Grant, has mixed feelings. It's strange to get attached so much to a thing or a place, but without this, sure, there's a new station, and that will be a great thing. And for science, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the, the capabilities that we're going to provide are they're just so far beyond anything down here. But this was home, and that will probably be home for the next bunch. The designers of the new center learned much from the failings of the dome using the latest technology to tame the destructive power of the Antarctic snow. Their plan is to construct a station eight times as big as the dome and not on the ground, but in mid-air. The building will sit atop reinforced steel columns almost four meters high, allowing the snow to pass freely underneath and preventing drifts from building up and burying the station. The walls themselves are angled. Like aeroplane wings, they will force air passing beneath the station to increase in speed, blowing any settled snow away. And the structure will have another fail-safe mechanism to protect it from the elements. Although the Antarctic receives just 23 centimeters of snow each year, the designers knew that at these temperatures, it will never melt. So when the snow finally does reach the floor line of the new station, the building can be jacked up an additional four meters. And not just once, but twice. This innovation will give the new Amundsen Scott South Pole Station a lifespan of 45 years. But turning this revolutionary design into reality will test the mettle of the entire team. Midsummer 2004. With no nightfall, work continues through the 24 hours of daylight on the three wings. The new center will reduce its energy consumption by using heat saving materials called SIPs, or structural insulated panels, in its walls, roofs, and floors. Made of heat stopping foam sandwiched between two layers of plywood, to obtain the same heat conservation in a normal house, would require fiberglass nearly a meter thick. All right, slide it in. Whoa. Oh! There's a great deal to do, but keeping on schedule is no easy task in the punishing cold. Steel seems to suck the temperature right out of you if you have to sit up there for long times. Stay out here long enough, you get a free Antarctic nose job. A little here, a little there. Gone, free of charge. Frostbite is a constant threat for all the workers. Station veterans have found unusual ways to fend off the cold. This is an old Alaska snow machiner's trick for avoiding frostbite, and that's duct tape. So you see people with duct tape from their cheeks across their noses all the way across to the other side. Decided to try it, it works great. But the workers here are a tough breed. So tough, they can forget to come in out of the cold. To avoid frostbite, every 90 minutes, they must take a compulsory break. Break time! At the pole, energy conservation is essential. Delivery costs make petrol four times more expensive than at home. A litre here costs over four pounds. So engineers have gone to extraordinary lengths to make sure that energy is squeezed out of every last drop of fuel. The station's power plant is now up and